I do want to recognize, and I know that he's not able to speak today, but U.S. Marshal, who was a witness, Thomas Brown, who also gave an impact statement in court today, and we want to thank him. But my sister, Judge Glenda Hatchett, um, I know that this is has been a tough day, yes. but it's a day of vindication. It is. It we is. are proud of you, and you speak for so many women and men who have been victims. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I want to say to my son, I just wait, wait, yeah, no, come on, you, my son no. Chris Stewart, he's my no. son. No, he's my son. He's look, we claim him, but anyway, so proud of him, so proud of what you do, so proud of the justice. We all stand here together in representing this phenomenal woman, Judge Hatch. Um, clearly, I am surrounded by an enormous amount of support, and I am very grateful to my law firm. Stuart Miller Simmons and all the people here who have really stood in the gap. CK, we have these people, Gerald, they just represent a few of the people who have really been on the battlefield. And as Chris said, CK has really been the person who has been leading this. I want to talk to you about what this has meant to me. Uh, and I'm grateful that you're all here so that I can just have this opportunity collectively. Because I hope you understand that every time I talk about this, I am in fact having to relive what happened to me. I was at a reception, so I'm gonna be very candid with you, I'm gonna be fairly brief, I'm gonna be very candid about what happened so that there's no misunderstanding about what went on. I was the guest of then retired uh, Sheriff Thomas Brown at a reception for the Georgia Sheriff's Association. I was greeted with such, I was welcome, people were just happy to see me, people wanted to take pictures. I felt very comfortable. And so for this to happen was just like, my goodness. And I was standing at a table and the defendant, who I will continue to call the defendant, came up uninvited and I was introduced to him as Judge Hatchett. To be cordial, I'll make this very quick. My family is from Troop County, Georgia. I said that, but I didn't know where Blackley County was. He poked me just momentarily in the chest. It's right in the heart of Georgia. But then he grabbed my breast. He grabbed my left breast. He squeezed it. He then started rubbing on my breast until Thomas Brown intervened literally had to take his hand off of me and push him off of me. I am a very strong woman. I pride myself on being strong. And I really thought I was fine. I'm just gonna tell you exactly what happened. I'm fine, this happened Tuesday night. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I pressed charges the next morning. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I even went to a dinner that Wednesday night. Thursday morning, I could not get out of bed. And I want to be candid about this. I'm being very, because people who know me, my life is very public, but my life is very private. I bet you a thousand dollars, very few of you could say anything about my personal life, and that is by design. Even before I went on television, I am very private, almost introverted in my personal life. And so here it is, you know, I am sobbing, literally sobbing. I could not stop crying. I could not get out of bed that Thursday morning. My assistant, Naima Rashad, has been with me for some 12 years or so at that time, was like, she'd never seen me like that. I rarely cry. Very people have ever seen me cry. And I could not even get up to go and get something to eat. That's how, in what horrible shape I was. I want to be very candid that I did go into therapy that evening at six o'clock with Dr. Susan May. And I say that because there's sometimes it's such stigma about therapy. I needed help. My life had been changed. And as I said to the judge in the court this morning, that I never expected that I would be so deeply affected by this. I could barely get through my impact statement 
See, my eyes are still puppy. I cried and cried and cried in court. And thankfully, I've at least gotten that out so that I hopefully won't break down today, and I might. But what I said is that there is a scar that he left. And what I really resent is that someone could have that kind of power over me. That somebody could make me in that moment feel helpless. I have never felt so helpless in my entire life. And I was angry, frankly. I was angry that I didn't slap him. I didn't kick him. But now I understand victims. I was absolutely frozen. And so I stand here today, as they have said, that I have been on the other side of this. I, you know, I've never been the victim. I have been the advocate. I have been supporting people. I have been trying to make sure that people's rights were protected. And here I am being a victim. And so it would have been easy for me to just, you know, go home and say, okay, well, it's an unfortunate situation. I had to file charges. There had to be accountability. Because the message needs to be clear that you cannot do this. How dare you do this? And if he would do this to me after having been introduced to him as Judge Hatchet, what else is happening? What about the women and men who are out here who don't have the resources that I have, who don't have the support of this amazing law firm and these amazing lawyers and all these people in the community who have stepped up and have been with me. This has been 20 months, 20 months that they have manipulated the system with delays after delays after delays, in my opinion, so that he could hold on to not only his salary, but his pension. And I'm going to go there. I am going to go there. The governor did nothing. I'm going to go there. The governor, after men and women stood in front of the Capitol last October and demanded that the governor take action. He never suspended him until this today, when he resigned, he has been on salary and will have his full benefits. And so that is outrageous and it's unacceptable. And yes, I went there. And so I will stay and I will take a few questions today and I appreciate you all being collectively here so that I don't have to keep reliving this over and over as I talk. But I just wanna to say to the victims out there, speak up. People have to be accountable. And the judge said to me before I left the court today, I hope that you will continue to speak up. And that is what I will do. That is what this law firm will do. That is what others who are in this fight day in and day out will do. Because we must, we must be the voice for the voiceless. We must stand in the gap. We must be there to support people who are not able to do what needs to be done to seek justice. And so with that, I will open it up for questions. And I got through it without falling apart. But if you go back and see the courtroom tape this morning, I mean, I was just all over the podium. I mean, I was like, whoop! And I didn't think I would, but I did. I mean, I, you know. It, is, it has been hard. Judge Patrick, why do you suppose the court system and the governor took so long to uh, recognize that this was uh, a serious issue? Well, first of all, the governor still hasn't done anything. Uh, the defendant resigned this morning before entering a plea to preserve, basically, in my opinion, his pension. Had he taken the plea, excuse me, had he taken the plea, and been on the record as being guilty of this sexual assault, he would have forfeited it under, under state law. And so I think that this was carefully orchestrated. I said to the judge this morning, I appreciate the backup with COVID and so forth and so on, but he was scheduled to plead, let's be very clear, the second week in September of last year, and he didn't, and it kept kept getting delays, kept getting delays. He was gonna plea, I'm gonna go to trial, I'm gonna plea, back and forth, back and forth. Until finally, I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. 
and it was finally set. And I think that um, Judge Brewer did a remarkable job. He actually went further than what the prosecutors asked for this morning. And he made it very clear as to why he did not grant first offender coverage or, 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 or um, what am I saying? Protection. Protection. Thank you. That's, I, that's why I have good people around me. Does that answer your question? Yes. How do you feel about the sentence? I think the justice was served, Donna. I do. I, um, I do think that there was an abuse of the system on behalf of the defense in this case. I just think there were too many delays. I would have liked for the solicitor to have been far more aggressive in opposing so many delays. Because I think, I think she got outmaneuvered, frankly. I mean, you know me long enough to know I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think she got outmaneuvered and to the point where I had to put my foot down and say absolutely enough. This has got to be resolved. And if he hadn't entered the plea today, he would then be, um, we would be on trial next Monday and Tuesday. And so I didn't know whether he was going to show up this morning. I mean, we went um, and it was scheduled, but we didn't know for sure whether he did. And uh, he did resign, as I said shortly before. But I do think justice was served. I do. Um, I think there has to be accountability. And I think that this all needs to be done publicly. I will also add that um, his attorney had asked some time ago through the prosecutor to communicate with me if I would accept his apology and drop the charges. And the answer was an emphatic no. He did not apologize to me today. The judge gave him three opportunities to speak. Each time you were there, each time the judge said, is there anything else you wish to say? three separate times in the process. And he said no. It would have taken him 30 seconds to have just, I was right on the front row. It would have taken him 30 seconds to say, I'm sorry, he never said it. And you know what, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I do not define myself based on whether he will ever apologize to me. That is not who I am. And I really, that's it. I don't, I don't care if he apologizes. Is there a different standard for women victims uh, accused of I'm sorry, a victim. Is, is, is there a different standard for the issue of standards? Well, I think. To women victims who are, particularly when they're accusing men who have problems? Well, I can't say that emphatically. I do think in the situation that it was handled poorly. I do. I do. I think the governor could have made an important statement as I was talking about earlier, that spoke to this and the impropriety of this. And for the governor's office to issue a statement saying that they weren't going to do anything because he was not on duty is absurd. It's ludicrous. Um, and so I, I can't say yes emphatically on that, but I do have real concerns about what happens. And let me just go a step further on this. What if I were not Judge Hatchett? What if, what if I didn't have a Chris Stewart? What if, what if I didn't have a C.K. Hoffman? What if I didn't have a Gerald Griggs? And all of these lawyers, and all of these people who have come and stood with me shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, what if I couldn't afford to go to therapy? Would I have just, what would have happened that Thursday? What would have happened to me? You know, I am surrounded by so much support because I'm Judge Hatchett. But what about the women and men victims who aren't? And that's why I've dedicated so much of my life, as you know professionally, advocating and trying to be a voice for people who don't have a platform, who will never be able to stand in front of a press conference, who will never be heard. And so, yeah, I did file charges, and yes, I was going to see this too. And I Okay, uh, Andrew Kraft here now in the anchor chair. You have been listening right now to Judge Glenda Hatchett there in Atlanta from earlier this morning addressing the public for the very first time after being allegedly sexually assaulted by a Georgia sheriff at the Georgia 